for your wonderful Sabbath, uh, a time of rest, which we all so desperately need. And we are just really wonderful to come together as a family. So much of us, we all love each other. And it's just a beautiful thing. We thank you for showing us that we need to be global, Lord, in our mindset, that we can no longer live in our own small little world, that we need to look outward and look at what's happening all over the world, Lord. So we can have that experience that Billy Graham had as toward the end of his life, as that of a globalist and seeing humanity as a whole. We give you all the glory in Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, you're on. Okay, hold on. Let me see, hold on. Okay, you're on, babe. Okay, well, good afternoon. Happy Sabbath to everybody. I'm going to attempt to give a little history on Iceland. Now, I have a little interesting prehistory, what brought me to Iceland. When I was a little kid, way back in the day, four or five years old, my mother took up these pictures and as we was going through them, I asked my mother, I'm like, uh, who are these white people in the picture here? <laughs> she looked at me, well, that's my dad and his brothers and sisters. I'm like, oh, so I kind of, this. okay, whatever, I just left that alone. But the years went by and I heard this and I might've been a little of this and might've been a little of that. So I did an ancestry dot com research here a couple of years ago. It's just kind of interesting. Well, let's see, what am I really? My name is German. Last name is German. So I was kind of amazed when it started out in some of the beautiful countries in Africa. Okay. And it moved up to 15% German. I'm like, okay, another 15% uh, uh, England. I'm like, okay, S Scottish. Irish, and what's this little green thing, Norway up here? Oh, and it showed on the map, map, Norway, it showed Iceland in the same color. So some years later, here I am checking it out, like, hey, well, what's the difference? Oh, the Vikings were the first one to land, and the Vikings were from Norway. I'm like, okay, so... This is interesting. Well, let me check Iceland out. I've heard so much. I've been confused between Greenland and Iceland. Okay, which one is which now? Okay, okay, okay. The small one is Iceland and the big one is Greenland. Okay. So let me check it out. So that's what I did with help from my little Donna here. And I discovered some stuff and she discovered a whole lot more and put it together. And so here we go on a little adventure with Iceland. Iceland is a Nordic island nation and is defined by its dramatic landscape with volcanoes, geysers, hot springs, and lava fields. Most of the population lives in the capital Reykjavik, which runs on geothermal power and is home to museums that trace back to Iceland's Viking history. The closest bodies of land are Greenland to the west, 180 miles, and the Faroe Islands to the southeast, 290 miles. Geology. Iceland is a geologically a young land and is located on both the Iceland hotspot and the Mid-Atlantic Range which runs right through it. The location means that the island is highly geologically active with earthquakes and volcanoes. It is also the largest volcanic Iceland in the world. There are 30 active volcanic systems of which 13 have erupted since the settlement of the island in eight 874 BC. The western part of the island sits on the North American plate, which moves west. 
the eastern part sits on the Euro-Asian plate, which moves east. The divergent tectonic activity of both plates caused the seabed to tear open and the resulting crack to be filled with magma, which over time creates a submarine mountain range. Population, only about 20% of Iceland is inhabitable and all urban centers and towns are located on the coast. Iceland has a population of 368,792, making it one of the least densely populated countries in Europe. Until the 20th century, Iceland relied largely on fishing and agriculture. The industrialization of the fisheries and Marshall Plan following World War II brought prosperity, and Iceland became one of the wealthiest and most developed nations in the world. History in Iceland. Most Icelandic people are descendants Norwegian settlers, as well as the Gauls from Ireland and Scotland, who were brought over as slaves during the 9th century BC. Recent DNA analysis suggest that around 66% of the male settlers was of Norse ancestry, whereas the female population was 60% Celtic. Iceland remained extremely unchanged in settlement issues until the 20th century. Iceland is also known as one of the youngest land masses on the planet and was one of the least places on earth, last places on earth to be settled by humans. Surprisingly, over 1,000 years ago, Vikings from Norway discovered Iceland by accident. Religion in Iceland has been predominantly Christian since the adoption of Christianity as the state religion by parliament under the influence of Olaf Trygabasan, the king of Norway. Around 1000 BC, between the 9th and 10th century, the prevailing religion among the early Icelanders was the Northern Germanic religion, the worship of Thor, etc., which perished for centuries ever even after the official Christianization of the state. Starting in the 1530s, Iceland was originally Catholic and under the Danish crown. However, they formally switched to Lutheranism with the Icelandic Reformation, which reached its highest point in 1550. Since then, the Lutheran Church of Iceland has remained the country's state church. Freedom of religion has been granted to all Icelanders since 1874. The Church of Iceland is supported by the government, but all registered religions receive support from, the, from a church tax paid by taxpayers over the age of 16. Since the late 20th century, and especially the early 21st century, Religious life in Iceland has become more diverse with a decline of Christianity, the rise of unaffiliated people and the emergence of new religions, notably heathenry, which seeks to reconstruct the dramatic folk religion. A large part of the population remain members of the Church of Iceland, but are actually ill-religious 
and athe atheistic. Politics in Iceland. On October 2008, the Icelandic banking system collapsed, prompting Iceland to seek large loans from the IMF and friendly countries. Widespread protest in late 2008 and early 2009 resulted in the resignation of the hard government, which was replaced on February 1, 2009 by a coalition government led by Social Democratic Alliance and the Left Green Movement. Social Democratic Minister Joanna was appointed prime minister, becoming the world's first openly homosexual head of government of the modern era. Elections took place in April 2009, and a continuing coalition government consisting of the Social Democrats and the Left Green Movement was established in May 2009. The economic crisis in 2008 resulted in the largest migration from Iceland since 1887, around 5,000 people. In 2009, Iceland's economy stabilized under the government of Joanna and grew by 1.6% in 2012, but many Icelanders remain unhappy with the state of the economy and the government's political and economic policies. The center-right independent party was returned to power. In combination with the Progressive Party in the 2013 elections. On August 1, 2016, Joannesson became the new President of Iceland. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender LGBT rights in Iceland are very progressive. Iceland is frequently referred to as one of the most LGBT friendly countries in the world. Same sex couples have had equal access to adoption and IVF since 2006. In February 2009, a minority government took office headed by Joanna, the world's first openly gay head of government in modern times. The Icelandic parliament amended the country's marriage law on June 11, 2010 by a unanimous vote to define marriage as between two individuals, thereby making same-sex marriage legal. The law took effect on June 27, 2010. Gender wage gap. Women in Iceland generally en enjoy good gender equality. As of 2018, 88% of working age women are employed. 65% of students attending university are female. And 41% of members of parliament are women. Nevertheless, women still earn about 14% less than men. Though these statistics do not take into account the hours worked over time and choices of employment. Iceland has the world's highest proportion of women in the labor market with significant child care allocations for working women and three months parental leave for both men and women. In 2018, Iceland introduced the first policy in the world 
that requires companies and institutions with more than 25 employees to prove that they pay men and women equally for a job of equal value. The policy is implemented through a job evaluation tool called the Equal Wage Management Standard, or simply the system. If companies show they pay equal for the same positions, they receive certification. Being in, two, tw being in 2020, certification became a requirement and companies without certification occur a daily fine. The Nordic paradox. For the past 11 years, Iceland has led the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Index, earning the country the label of the best place in the world to be a woman. Iceland has some of the world's strongest laws on workplace equality and equal pay, as well as high outcomes for women in issues of health education, economic opportunity, and political representation. However, the index has a major flaw. It doesn't measure gender-based violence. Iceland has persistently high rates of domestic violence and sexual abuse. Scholars have termed this phenomena the Nordic paradox. Iceland and its fellow Nordic countries have been able to achieve significant structural equality for women in some areas, yet maintain disproportionate instances of violence against them. One theory to explain the Nordic paradox is that Increased gender equality fuels male resentment, creating frustrations that are channeled into physical violence, a mode of action where men can easily still dominate. And if we can pause the, the recording, I have, there's a, there's a um, three minute video that he wants to, do you want to? We don't want to get YouTube all excited so yeah all if christians were to do the work they would they were supposed to satan would be stirred and there would be a lot more persecution so anytime good is happening satan is always counteracting with evil yeah. so when women are fighting for women's rights then men become more abusive yeah they it's do. like everywhere yep yeah that that's sad you see you gotta watch the flags that are flying for good good no well, that bottom flag might have a little bad bad <laughs> So go ahead and play that. Okay. I mean, one in four women uh, are raped. Yeah, that's really scary. It's really bad. Very bad. I know in South Africa, it's bad too. Did you see what that one, there's a lady who came up with, um, and it's sad that it has to come to this, but there's this device that women that she made, I think it needs funding, but uh, they insert it um, inside themselves. So in case someone rapes them, it's like this, this device that um, catches onto the male body part and it can't be removed without surgery. So then you can identify who it was that raped you and it causes them damage as well. Wow. So there's like a, a whole bunch of people trying to fund this project so that can, but the fact that that even has to exist I know, gosh. It's so sad. And it, it makes you angry. I don't know if it makes anyone else angry. And you just want to scream out. And it, it's, you can't because it's not. It's just so. Ugh. It is. It's oh, horrible. It's despicable. Well, I wouldn't look for a Fahrenheit utopian society, not on anywhere on this earth, <laughs> until God fixes it. Yeah. You know, in my marriage to my daughter's um, father, uh, it was an abusive marriage. And 
I won't go into all the details, but I will tell you that when I got brave enough, because I tried a, a few times, I wanted to report it. But, you know, you fall into that. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have acted like this and he wouldn't have reacted like that. You know, I went through all that. And then when I finally got brave enough to report it and I ran out across the street to a neighbor's house and the police come. They arrested both of us because um, when they interviewed him, he had a bite mark on him because I had bitten him that uh, he had me pinned, you know, down face first. And I, my hands were unable to defend myself. So I just turned my head to bite his anywhere I could with my teeth to have him let go of me so I could run out. And because he had a bite mark on him, and because he was raised a criminal attorney's son, he knew his way around the law. They arrested both of us because it was his word against my word. And um, his bail was less than my bail. My bail was higher. And so the final last time that so we ended up going back again, <laughs> And the final, final, um, because I was afraid to lose my daughter, because I was threatened I was going to lose my daughter during all this, right? And so um, the final, final that happened, um, I drove the fight, let's say, when it was occurring, I got myself to the front yard and him chasing me. And it had to be done in front of the whole neighborhood in order that the police would not arrest me. That's how, that's how bad the system is that I had to allow him to abuse me horribly, right? Break my nose, all that in front of the whole neighborhood uh, without putting a hand on him. Because if I had put a hand on him, the same thing would have happened before. And I'd have lost my daughter. And so finally a neighbor saw, called, reported it. And that was, you know, the end of that um, journey. But that was right around the time that um, Nicole Simpson was also killed, you know, and that whole, um, that brought a lot of um, abuse into the forefront, right? People were being forced to have to look at this deeper. But um, yes, our system is just horrific on the woman's behalf, you know? It really is. Uh, I, I had, um, I had, um, what's his name again? Simpson? What's his first name? Oh, oh yeah. I had, I didn't even know who he was. They gave me a manifest and they said, okay, you're going to have, um, OJ Simpson on your flight. And he's, he's got about five, um, Hertz rent a car executives. They're going to be sitting up front and then his wife, his two kids and the nanny are going to be sitting in the back. Then I went, well, first I went, who's O.J. Simpson? And they looked at me like, what? I, where, did you, where did you go? You know? And they told me it was a football thing. I went, oh, okay, whatever. And so he came on with his executives and they were playing cards. He was very rude. He wasn't a nice man at all. He looked at my pen that I had on my blouse. He goes, he pointed at my pen. He goes, your pen, can I use it? And I, and I, I gave it to him. I said, well, can I get it back when you're done? And he's like, yeah. So he was playing like a crossword puzzle and his wife and two kids came on with the nanny and she was stunningly beautiful, but you could see the look on her. She was so, you could see how unhappy she was. And her and the kids went to the back in coach to sit while OJ sat in the front with his buddies, his executive buddies. And I just felt so, I, she never said one, one word the whole time you could just see a woman that was so incredibly unhappy you could see it on her face and then not a couple years later she's gone she's dead so i was sad. not impressed by him at all not at all all the signs were there too but yeah. you know for her yep but it just got swept aside because of his celebrity because of who he is yep he was very arrogant and you know I know part of the history of he came from the ghetto. He came from a poor background. And for him to be so arrogant like he was, 
it's just sad that you can forget where you came from. Yeah, that's it. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Racism in Iceland. <clears throat> the number of immigrants in Iceland has grown rapidly since 2006. In 1990, there were around 5,000 non-Icelandic citizens residing in Iceland. But in 2006, the number had grown up to 18,000. A rapid increase took place between 2006 and 2008, with 2008 having the largest number of non-Icelandic citizens in Iceland, around 24 thousand. In 2013, a study was done to find out about the effect of everyday prejudice and discrimination in Iceland. It consists of 89 participants, 72 of whom were of foreign origin, while the remaining 17% were Icelandic. By January 1, 2012, the largest group of immigrants residing in Iceland was from Poland, about 9,000 individuals. The next largest group was from Lithuania, about 1,600 individuals. Immigrants from Germany, Denmark, Latvia, the United Kingdom, Philippines, and Thailand were between 500 and 1,000 from each country. The increase of people with non-Icelandic backgrounds has considerably increased the discussion about prejudice, racism, and discrimination in Icelandic society. Okay. Okay, well, you know, you can't say the time. Can somebody read that very top Hidden. sentence? Hidden prejudices. Hidden prejudice or everyday prejudice and discrimination towards people with non uh, Icelandic backgrounds. Oh, okay. thank you, Francisco. Yeah, you're <laughs> welcome, now. Thank you, brother. Yeah, you're welcome. With the non Icelandic backgrounds have been far less discussed and researched by academics than racism in general. In a research paper done, in 2010, it defines everyday racism as hidden. Everyday forms of discrimination examples include being ignored and isolated, made fun of and embarrassed, or being in some way treated differently than people belonging to the majority group. There are incidents that would seem innocent and harmless, but when they build up, they can greatly affect people's mental and physical well-being. If prejudice and lack of respect for certain people, groups of society have become like any other routine and seen as normal behavior, it's not recognized as prejudice at least not by the members of the majority group. This means that the majority group or the group which holds the most power in society does not perceive all of the prejudice as discrimination. They do not define them as racism and therefore do not view them as a problem. When we look at an average From all groups, 82% of participants had experienced one or more incident during the two week period. The percentage was 93% for people with non Icelandic backgrounds and 35% for people with an Icelandic background. So when we look at the you know, the fact that this is a very, you know, when we look back at the first few slides, it said how, you know, um, how free and the people are just uh, really, uh, women are 
given so much rights and equality. Well, one of the reasons, one of the things you have to take into factor is this right here, that it's not recognized as prejudice, at least not by the members of the majority group. This means that the majority group or the group which holds the most power in society does not perceive all the prejudices as discrimination. Therefore, they do not define them as racism, therefore does not view them as a problem. So this could also be one of the situations where you're saying there's so much equality, but in actuality, they're not, they're not recognizing that there is discrimination. That's their perception of equality, yeah. but they're not looking at the right. total bottom line issues. And yet these immigrants all here, they're saying, hey, we're being discriminated. Okay, can somebody read that title on the Just top? Just the title on the top. <laughs> There's something blocking Icelanders it. Icelanders flock to support asylum, asylum seekers and counter racist groups. Thank you, brother, again. When the small nationalist party of Iceland announced that they were going to protest against asylum seekers who have been protesting in the square in recent weeks, crowds of people flocked to show their support and their solidarity against racism. In the Facebook event, it stated, the Nationalist Party planned to protest the violence that asylum seekers have projected in Icelandic society and the Icelandic police. As if to say, the refugees were the ones with pe pepper spray and batons. We would really appreciate, we would really appreciate to see as many people united against races as possible. Together, we can show the Icelandic nationalists that we are so much stronger when united and have fun while we are at it. It shows there's another scene of the nationalist stuff, like some of the stuck up Americans, us first and we'll get to the world in another decade. Nationalists, huh? We've learned in this movie, it's not very good. Crowds of people flocked with flags, anti fascist signs, and managed to completely cover the nationalists. Good. Numerous Icelandic bystanders at the square during the day and into the evening to create a festival-like atmosphere. We interviewed a couple of asylum seekers, Samuel and Moses from Nigeria, to ask why they were protesting. The Asbru refugee camp is like being in prison. One can't go anywhere. We, we have nothing to do. We can't go to school. We can't learn Icelandic, can't work, and we've received no medical care. Okay, if you can pause the video, I mean, pause the recording, we're gonna... Well, that's it for this. Comments are welcome. <laughs> okay, oh, great presentation. Can... All you can see is wow. <laughs> I know. I know. It's pretty amazing, yeah. I don't I, think I'd want to move to Iceland. <laughs> I mean, in the beginning, the first few slides, you would have thought, oh, I want to move to Iceland. But the last few slides, you're like, wait a minute. I don't know if I want to. <laughs> yeah. That cold hearted, cold weather place. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stay right here in sunny southern. <laughs> right. Yeah, we kind of know what would happen if women got equality. <laughs> I wonder, you know, would this happen all over the world where all of a sudden there'd be all this rise in domestic violence simply because women became equal, equal, you know, members yeah. of society? You know, it's it's amazing, it could, but yeah. it's amazing, but men do get jealous. They do. When women yeah. advance, they, they feel a sense of worthlessness and, you know, a sense of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's really, it's it's a dilemma, really. Do you suppose it's because they've been uh, brainwashed, let's say, into believing that they must be superior? And so it 
makes them feel that they've lost all control of that model that they think they're supposed to be. I think I it's tied to their self-worth. Yeah. Because they yeah. don't have, if a woman can do everything they can, then what are they good for anymore? Yeah. It comes down to status quo. Yeah, but it's a lie, though, because sure. that's how the patriarchy hurts men as well, because it makes them think that all they have is self-worth is, you know, if they can cut yes. the grass and all this. But yes. people can be loved for their personality and the fact that they're a human being. And the fact that, you know, so many people don't understand that is really sad and it causes, look, how many problems. Yeah, and in, in Iceland in particular, their situation, the men in Iceland have predominantly, they're very masculine men. They have a very masculine mindset. They're fishermen, they're hunters, you know, so, you know, the women are doing more academic type stuff, you know, more technology. The women are all in technology and the men have not been able to adapt into this new, um, uh, the 21st century type mindset where, cause they're still very masculine men, meat eating kind of mentality. And so that's what makes it harder. If they haven't been, in fact, in the schools and the colleges, it's like 60 to 75% of women in schools than men. Cause men are out there on the fishing boats and you know, they're doing, you know, uh, like laborious type work, you know, like blue collar type work. So well, yeah, it's, they haven't been trained. Once they learn, <laughs> put those funds together and move forward. You ain't got to worry about who makes a nickel more, who cares? <laughs> but, but it's the mindset that like she just said a minute ago that the guy got to do this and guys get old, they do less than women. They lay up and have day and the cow turn to bed. So what's the big deal? Let put the funds together <laughs> and let it flow. That's so funny. <laughs> were guys to take. <laughs> I, re I really appreciated your um, presentation, Brother Renee, and I, I really liked how you just began that with the personal um, part to it, you know, where you were showing that about your family and trying to understand where you came from and understanding yourself and yeah, you know, well, it was it's one thing that hurts when you see people like this country this border was put up so we found out a documentary to keep Europeans from mixing with the natives which were here first that's mongrel lords I guess I was considered a mongrel lord then because I had a little bit of everything in me but that doesn't bother God that doesn't Amen. change. I had to tell one guy, he was a good Mormon friend, a good Mormon friend. He come over for dinner and everything. I'm like, you know, Russ, where you get this thing? Now in Vietnam, before we got wounded, would my old native blood made you black and you would couldn't be accepted properly in the Mormon? He, <laughs> he started out, <laughs> you know, I don't know that. That's a good question. <laughs> so you can't go by that. Racism needs to just stop. That's why this movement is teaching us that. Oh, and we got so much to learn. <laughs> Amen. And it's really, it's really that. neat because you see the pictures of his great, his grandfather on his, uh, <laughs> on his dad's side. Your dad's side. My mom's or side. Your mom's side. And they are literally white people. <laughs> All right. Who are these people? <laughs> They're literally white people. And it's his mother's dad. Isn't that funny? dad and his brothers and sisters? I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. Well, okay. I'll live with that. No, no big deal. But it hurts when you see that portrayed like, you can't mix in this country. We're splitting the border down there just because of that. That's why I don't want to mix them with that. And the natives were here first. Yeah. So, that's well, interesting. Do that and ancestry.com. You'll be shocked. <laughs> I'm like, where did this come from? 4% Norwegian. And uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Did you guys want to see the Belarus now? I would yes, just please. like to make a comment. About oh, yes. sure. Go ahead. Um, I was very interesting to, uh, interested to, to know what's going on there because, as we know, Iceland is number one in the world when it comes to equality. Yes. Um, if you, there is charts on Google that you can find and it shows which country is what number when it comes to equality. 
But when they measure equality, they look at how many women and men are in education, how many women and men are in leadership position and stuff like that. It doesn't measure real life. Yes. When I did Romania, Romania is 25, number 25. Mm -hmm. United States is number 51 on oh, equality. No. So I was thinking real life, me living here, I'm seeing much more practical equality between men and women, more rights that a woman has here than Romania. But yet in Romania, Romania is number 25, United States is 51. So there's definitely some discrepancy, yeah. you know, in how you are treated mm -hmm. and how you are seen. But yeah. anyway, uh, if the government gives you rights and you have the right, you know, for education and leadership and equal pay and all that, it's definitely good. Yeah. When it comes to racism, though, what's happening in Iceland is not only a local issue, it's all over Europe. Yes. Before the communism fell and before all this Afghan war and what's happening in the Middle East, uh, Europe pretty much was um, closed. The only one that was open for emigration and stuff like that was Western Germany. Mm -hmm. So all the other people, it's like a shock for them to see people from other countries come in, you know, and it's like that lady said, a culture problem. Now we're losing our culture, yeah. you know, yes. because they don't want to change to what we are and let's change everybody. If they come here, they have to be like us right. and stuff like that. So that's, that is the main reason I think that UK got out of the, you know, the Britex and all that kind of stuff because they do not like people from other countries to, to reach asylum in their country. Yeah. So this is a big issue all over Europe. Yes. Yeah, and thank you for this presentation. Yes, but I had heard, maybe I have a question. I'd heard that one of the towns in Romania, it was by some Adventist church, members had an Adventist mayor. I forget. I can't think of remember the name of the town though. Is that true? She was a woman. A woman. A mayor of one of the big towns in Romania. I can't think of the name of it though. I can um I can Google to see. I haven't heard that though. Okay. Okay. Check it out. Yeah, yeah. that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know as I, as I said Romania failed in 2000 17, 2018, 2019, maybe they had the election and one it was a man and a woman. And they did not elect the woman, even though they knew what the man was capable of. He sold the country to Austria and some other places. Um, there is massive, massive cutting of entire mountains. The forest is cut down. And Ooh. trucks after trucks are leaving the country going to Austria. Ooh. So that was done by the president and it is known. And even though they did not choose the woman because Romanian people cannot see how a woman can be a president. Well, no, this was a mayor of a but town. Yes, yeah, I understand. That's interesting too. <laughs> Check it out for me, please. <laughs> so, I will. Yeah. I will. A female, yeah, a male, a woman, a Europe, uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, um, you know, the, I guess, I don't know why, but I just have this sense, like, there's so much hatred in the world. <laughs> there is. It's like, I, I guess I've been doing, you know, world research and learning about different things, and I just see so much hate. I don't know if you guys have noticed that so when you're doing your research in all these different countries, but there's a lot of hatred, people hating people for, you know, gender differences, for racial differences, for um, equality, you know, e everything. Every, it's like so much hatred. It's just, I don't know. It's just unprecedented, I think. You know, it's, um, I was glad you brought that up. You brought that up last night and um, you actually made me think about that because 
I was more focused on how much I saw around me, you know, here. Yeah. And um, I was forgetting that piece. And you made me look at that. And then I was thinking about the Sunday law, you know, um, op oppression as the Sunday law and how um, the United States leads out in that and the rest of the world follows after right that there's that quote in there that the united states is first to lead out and especially under trump because yes. it, he voiced it and everyone watches the united states you know like jeff pippinger used to say when the united states catches the uh, how's that go when the united states sneezes the rest of the world catches a cold and um that is another sign that we're so close to that you know that oppressive law that we're, Sunday law yeah. um, being enacted because the behavior is just ramping up everywhere. Yeah. I just keep thinking, you know, in the next three years or so, or four years, um, you know, if, if Donald Trump does get elected, I mean, we're, we're, it's like over. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is just, I mean, and, and, and remember, there was a little bit of a controversy when we had that, that uh, presentation. I think it was Table that presented the, the Donald Trump being the last president. I mean, if he gets Oh, elected, yeah. Like, you, and they he, made him pull that when he was doing the seven last yes, presidents and, and the seven, uh, seventh day Adventist yes. church presidents. I, I mean, remember like, that. We can't say that he was wrong yet. We can't say that that was wrong because we don't know. Donald Trump could become the next president. And you know what? If he does, I guarantee you, he is going to be the last president. He's still on the agenda. That's why Pelosi and him is trying to get that lawsuit going against him to keep him out. But only God knows what's going to happen at that time. But you have to ask yourself the question. The sickness of gender inequality, racial inequality, who can have a mindset to think that that's going to go on to heaven and last forever and ever and ever. Oh, I'm going to kill him because he made me. <laughs> That's not going to be in heaven. Don't you realize what heaven's about? It's not about that. No, they don't realize what heaven's about. And I'm going to be crazy down here and I'm going to hate them over there and bring it on to heaven. No, you're not. <laughs> I don't think it's, so. just, it's the same people that, that kill and hurt other individuals in the name of God. Yep. Yes. Yes, you're right. Exactly Absolutely. Right. It's those very yeah. people that use the name of God, yeah. and they're the ones when Jesus comes back. But Lord, Lord, we could, didn't we do wonders in your name? Because I never knew you. Depart from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. Amen. So you'd have to, you would think that would click. Well, no, I, I, I can't go burning my neighbor's house down or shooting him because I'm mad at him, and now I'm going to bring that on to heaven. Yeah, right. But they have a different Jesus, like like Susanna was saying. Yeah. Do you think? Uh, all of a sudden this came in my mind and um, I could be very incorrect guys, but it did cross my mind. You know, when the Jews were given the warning about um, the planting of the banner that would go in the area, um, which conquer, uh, oh, they were given a first warning and some left during that warning before yes. the was that fall the of was I was thinking before, about that. Yes, Sister Dawn, I was thinking was about that before Trump. 70 AD. I was, yes, but I was thinking about it with Trump. And mm -hmm. I was thinking what a dark time that was. You, you know, that was a horrible dark time we were in with COVID and Trump. And oh, gosh, that was awful. And we've been given sort of a reprieve in ways where we're, we're yes that is where we are able yeah. to breathe a little bit where some what? people are maybe going to relax and go back to their old behavior which made me think oh, of my goodness the um the reprieve that that made people just right in that in that parable story and then they were and then came the conquering which would be then what you were saying uh but conquering. those that left did not go back Yes, you're, you know, yes. that was 68 AD, and uh, it was it Christmas, I forget which one, which Roman guard came in, and he, he said, he gave a pause, he goes, no, we're, you know, let's, let's, they had a two-year respite, oh. and then, that's what um, we're in, that's where we're at, 
Yes, and then and then who came in and conquered? Was it Titus? Yeah, Titus. He said, all right, that's it. We're going in. And Titus came in. And those that stayed with the old mindset, the old physical, they perished. Yeah. Yes, yes, wow. And then that was the destruction of the temple and everything. Wow, that's that's a very good picture. I that's, that's a good. parable right there. Mm -hmm. So where God's given us a reprieve. I mean, I really, this could really happen because the Republicans are really holding out. They are holding out for Trump. They are. Mm -hmm. They want him back. They're going to do everything they can, even corruption and fraud and everything under the sun. Yes. Oh, oh boy, he's you need a need a lot of prayer to love will come. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing everything he can to kill something that's respectable for humanity. Okay. Well, thank you for all the comments. Wonderful. Yes. You did a good job, baby. Okay. Did you guys want me to do Belarus too now? Yes, please. Okay. Hold on. I just put this together real quick, so it's it's good though. It's pretty, I just cut and paste basically, that's all I did. Okay, this is Belarus. Now I chose Belarus because I had nothing, I did not know anything about Belarus. I like the sound of the name. So I was like, Belarus, I wonder what's up with them. So that's why I chose them. Belarus is a very green landscape. Its natural vegetation covers 93.1% of the land and one third of all green landscapes are forests. It's very green. There's lakes, swamps, uh, virgin wild forests, flatlands, hills, and even islands. It's more on the cold side, but it's still pretty beautiful. It, this is the city, Minsk. These are the mountainous areas. This is when in the ice uh, winters and then their farming area, really beautiful place. Okay. After an initial period of independent feudal consolidation, Belarusian lands were incorporated into the Kingdom of Lithuania and the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Russian Empire, and eventually the Soviet Union. Belarus became an independent country in 1991 after declaring itself free from the Soviet Union. So here we are over here. California's way down here, Mexico. Here is Belarus. Belarus, Ukraine, Romania, Poland, Russia, Norway, here's Iceland, Ireland, France, Italy, Greece. Okay. Belarus officially, the Republic of Belarus is landlocked, is a landlocked country in Eastern Europe, meaning it's surrounded by land, landlocked. It is bordered by Russia to the east, Ukraine to the south, Poland to the west, and Lithuania and Latvia to the northwest, covering an area of 80,000 square feet, square miles, and with a population of 9.4 million, Belarus is the 13th largest and 20th most populous country in Europe. The country is administratively divided into seven regions, one, two, three, four. I could only find six, but it said this said seven. This could be wrong. Um, Minsk is the capital of the largest city, right in here. This is Minsk. The Belarusian language belongs to the family of Slavic languages and is very close to the Russian and Ukrainian. All three languages are used in the Cyrillic alphabet, which minor mod modifications in Ukrainian and Belarusian. Until the early 20th century, the Belarusian language stood out as a symbol of ethnic distinction. In the communist era, Russian became dominant. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, however, Belarusians is again being spoken and taught in schools as the national language. Now, the Belarus is a very complicated history. And I found this really, Nice little video that kind of sums it up in five minutes. And if I could play it, that would be great. Cool. Because it covered a lot more. Belarusian's history is a little bit more complex. Did I hear the Vikings were down there messing around? Yeah, they were. The Vikings <laughs> they did. They were everywhere. They were everywhere. 
Okay, any questions there? Okay. Yeah, what's the name of that gal that put the bomb in the water bottle? Oh, <laughs> yes, Melania, whatever her name was. That was pretty, that was pretty funny. I'll post that video in the, uh, in the thing. I, I don't know if the chat. Right, thank, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, the Treaty of Brusseltoff. Do we, re do we remember this? An agreement was reached in early December 1917 and a formal ceasefire was declared by mid-December, but determining the terms of peace between Russia and the Central Powers proved to be far more complicated. Negotiations began at Breslitov on, on December 22nd, leading their respective delegation were foreign ministers Leon Trotsky of Russia, Richard von Kuhlmann of Germany, and Count Ottokar Zervin, Zervin of Austria. In mid-February, the talks broke down when an angry Trotsky deemed the Central Powers' terms too harsh and their demands for territory unacceptable. Fighting resumed brie briefly, fighting resumed briefly on the Eastern Front, but the German armies advanced quickly, and both Lenin and Trotsky soon realized that Russia, in its weakened state, would be forced to give in to the enemy's terms. Negotiations resumed later that month and the final treaty was signed on March 3rd, 1918. Do we all remember that? When the pandemic was happening? This was the, the date that Elder Tess used as uh, one of the defining factors of uh, uh, COVID-19 being prophetic. Do you remember that? Does anybody remember that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. By the terms of the Treaty of Breslatov, Russia recognized the independence of Ukraine, Georgia, Finland, and gave up Poland and the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia to Germany and Austria and Hungary, and gave up Kars, Ardahan, and Batum to Turkey. The total losses constituted some 1 million square miles of Russia's former territory, a third of its population, or around 55 million people, a majority of its coal, oil, and iron stores, and much of its industry. Lenin bitterly called the settlement that abyss of defeat, dismemberment, enslavement, and humiliation. That Treaty of Breslatov was crushing to Russia because they lost so much. Okay, women of the revolution. Women who have played prominent roles in the protest sweeping across Belarus are subject to reprisals and threats. Amnesty International highlights the important role women activists have played in the protests after widely contested presidential elections and reveals, reveals state reprisals against them. Okay, this is a little bit of background. Last year, around August of 2020, Belarus had another presidential election. Now, Alexander uh, Lukashenko has been the president since 1994. He's the first president Belarus has ever had, but he's a dictator and he's corrupt and the, 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 the votes are terribly fraudulent. So there was a big revolution uh, around August and there was so much protest. I missed all that. I didn't know that this was happening, but this was huge. So you're gonna learn about it in here. Women activists, and, and, and who was the one, the force behind this protest? It was women. Women activists said that they had been accused of being bad mothers and bad wives and that the authorities had threatened to take their children away from them. They've also faced ill-treated treatment in detention centers and prison sentences resulted from unfounded criminal prosecution. Slivatlana, uh, she kind of, whatever, I can't even remember, whatever. A presidential contender forced into exile and Maria Kaliniskaya, her chief of staff thrown into prison Marfa 
Rapkova, a jailed human rights defender, and a journalist, Katsarina and Darya, both in prison for two years for live streaming of a protest action. These are some of the many women whose names have become synonymous with the struggle for freedom and human rights in Belarus. In a deeply patriarchal society with endemic domestic violence, women in Belarus have risked everything to stand up for their beliefs. The Belarusian authorities have retaliated with measures intended to target women activists and their organizations and their families. So if I could pause the uh, recording again, I have this video I wanna show. Oh, sorry. Okay, I can't see the top. I can see President Alexander Yugoshenko has been leading the country since the first presidential election held in 1994. Over the next two years, he rapidly consolidated his power. In 1995, he won a referendum that gave him the power to dissolve the legislature if he felt it violated the constitution. In 1996, he won another referendum that dramatically increased his power and also extended his original five-year term to 2001. Since then, his regime has been reckoned as an authoritarian dictatorship by Western observers. Opposition activists are often pressured or detained by the government and Lukashenko or those loyal to him control as of 2020, all of the seats in both house of the National Assembly. All judi judicial appointments, the media and the CEC, which has the power to approve or deny candidates for poli political office. Sergei Tikhanovsky is a Belarusian YouTuber, video blogger, dissident and pro-democratic activist. That's him. He is considered by Amnesty International to be a prisoner of conscience. He is known primarily for his activism against the government of Belarus, Belarus's long serving president, Alexander Lukashenko. In May, 2020, he announced his intention of running for the 2020 presidential election, but he was arrested two days afterwards. His wife, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, ended up as the main rival to Lukashenko in the contested elections. This is his wife. She ended up becoming the main contender against him. Lukashenko said in a speech at a tractor factory in Minsk that he was absolutely sure the next Belarusian president would be a man. Our constitution is not for women. Our society has not matured enough to vote for a woman. This is because by constitution, the president handles a lot of power, he said. On August 4, Lukashenko gave a state of national of the nation speech in which he threatened harsh sanctions against any unauthorized demonstrations ahead of the election and implicitly warned the political elite not to betray him. It's really a very interesting historic moment for Belarus. We have never seen anything like it. Right now, we really have no idea what could happen. Everything is possible. The Belarusian society is really surprising everybody this election season. I'm telling you, we missed all this because I had no idea that just this had just happened. And it was really pretty amazing. Yeah. So here's another one. I'm just going to show a couple of uh, minutes on this. Link it in the uh, chat so you, any, everybody can watch it on their own time. It's really good. Belarus LGBT community faces violence every day. The authorities exclude us from public discourse. They ignore our problems, laugh at our faces when we try to address them and openly persecute us. The last attempt to register a public association for LGBTQ people was made in 2013. The Department of Justice rejected the application and the Supreme Court confirmed the decision ruling that there was no need to create such an organization as there's no homophobia and that the constitution protects us all equally. The next year, an architect, a gay man, was attacked in Minsk. He was beaten so badly, surgeons had to remove 20% of his brain to keep him from dying. He passed away 17 months later. His attacker had called him a pedor, which means faggot, but a judge ruled that the crime had no homophobic motive even though it happened just outside of the entrance to a gay nightclub. Now, as the Lukashenko crime cracks down, we are beaten up 
and detained by the police alongside demo demo democracy protesters. Every day I receive news about our activists and community members being detained and tortured in prison. This is from Andre Zavale, which is a, um, a, a, a LGBTQ activist in Belarus. So they don't have any, any rights whatsoever. The religion in Belarus. Christianity is the main religion in Belarus. Mm -hmm. With Eastern Orthodoxy being the largest denomination, the legacy of the state atheism of the Soviet era is evident in the fact that a large part of the Belarusians are not religious. Moreover, other non-traditional and new religions have sprung up in the country after the end of the Soviet Union. According to the most recent estimations for 2011 by the Ministry of Interior, 48% of the Belarusians are Orthodox Christians, 41% are irreligious, which they are atheist or agnostics. 7.1% are Catholic Christians, either Roman Catholic or Belarusian Greek Catholic, and 3.5% are members of other religions. The constitution provides for freedom of religion. However, the government restricted this right in practice. Respect for religious freedom has recently worsened. The government continues to restrict religious freedom in accordance with the provisions of a 2002 law on religion and a 2003 concordat with the Belarusian Orthodox Church a branch of the Russian Orthodox Church and the only officially recognized Orthodox denomination. Gender equality. Belarus remains on a whole a deeply patriarchal society where traditional ideas of gender norms and identities prevail. Gender, gender stereotypes which define the correct behavioral codes for both women and men persist to this day as do normative standards of femininity and masculinity. Homophobia is also commonplace. Moreover, gender by and large remains an unpopular framework through which to view social oppression and inequality. More often than not, the dominant order is explained away as a matter of tradition or with the flippant response, it's just the way things are. So very little gender equality there. That's why it makes it so amazing how the women are, are, are the ones behind this protest. Throughout the pandemic, President Lukashenko dismissed the seriousness of COVID-19. Authorities did not introduce any lockdown measures despite high levels of community transmission. In November, authorities in Minsk and several other cities required mask wearing in public. Authorities attempted to silence medical professionals who spoke up about the danger of the pandemic. After Dr. Sergei Lazar gave an interview critical of the government's slow response, the government fired him from his position as chief of emergency medical medicine at Weisbeck Hospital. Does this all sound familiar? Mm. Trump trying to fire Fox. Yes, totally. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think I'm done. Okay, I'm going to read just a few. I have a few things that I read, and I'm just going to read a little bit more history here. Okay, yeah, Belarus is known as being the last dictatorship in Europe. Um, even its leader, Alexander Lukashenko, admits it's better to be a dictator than gay. Um, August 2020, they had presidential elections and they do every five years. He won for the sixth time with an 80% win. The opposition candidates have had to leave the country for their safety. Many of his distractors have taken to the streets and many of them have been jailed. We're talking no less than 6,700 detainees. Belarusian prisons are very brutal. It is very clear that he has manipulated all the elections that he doesn't even try to hide. He said, we have rigged the last elections. 93.5% have voted for Lukashenko. But they say it's not a European outcome. So we have made it 86% instead. That's what Lukashenko said. He is a real dictator of the purest sense of the word. Most of the people against him think he's a megalomaniac. During the coronavirus, Lukashenko refused to lock down the country and he discouraged people from wearing masks. He called the pandemic a global psychosis. He was very clear 
when he said that this coronavirus thing will not affect him. He organized mass events such as May 9th, 2020 parade shortly after over 70,000 people were infected with the virus out of a country of only 9 million people, including Lukashenko himself. Sociological studies are virtually prohibited. Organizations that want to conduct political surveys have to be approved by the government and often they don't publish the results. In 2020, several media outlets tried to do an online political service and guess what happened? The survey found out that Lukashenko received just 3% in intended votes, but then the government banned election polls. It's hard to believe that in the middle of a pandemic that Lukashenko received 80% of the vote. However, he doesn't have a lot of support. He does have a lot of support in the rural areas. It is clear that there is electoral fraud. International observers were banned and on election day, the internet shut down and several journalists critical of Lukashenko's regime, regime were expelled from the country during the campaign. On the day after the election, Lukashenko's opponents, which are clearly more than 10% of voters, took to the streets to protest. There were more than 200,000 people who came out to protest in Minsk. That's one in 10 inhabitants. It's very dangerous to protest in Belarus because people are imprisoned and some have died there. The fact that more than 200 people dare to risk their lives to protest says it all. Sietlana Sik. Kanovskaya, Lukashenko's fiercest opponent, was taken hostage and forced to make bogus pleas to the public to stop protesting. Her husband is still being imprisoned and several members of her team have also been detained. She has since left Belarus and lives in Lithuania. She has announced that she is prepared to lead a government in exile. She has established a coordination council for the democratic transition. Lukashenko is furious and she and her team could be tried for attacking Belarus's national security. All of this explains why both the European Union like Canada and the UK do not recognize the results of the election. The elections of August, 2020 are considered a fraud by almost every country in the world. Countries like China, Tajikistan and Russia accept the election results. Russia and Belarus are sister countries and in the 1990s, they considered joining officially as one country. Some of the gas and oil that arrives from Russia to Europe passes through Belarusian pipelines. Putin and Lukashenko have been great friends for decades. Can Belarusians become dem democratic? Since early 2020, elections between Lukashenko and Putin have waned. Russia had, has had great aspirations since the 1990s to annex Belarus but remember, Lukashenko is a me megalomaniac. He's not the classic dictator who agrees to be a puppet for anyone else, much less to be a dictator of a country that ceases to exist. Putin has threatened Lukashenko in a way that he knows best to cut off the country's oil and gas supply. So in 2020, Lukashenko bro broke ranks and threatened to steal Russian oil passing through Belarusian pipelines. In other words, interrupt Russia's sale of oil to Europe that goes through pipelines passing through Belarusian territory. So at any time, Belarus could divert those pipes and keep, it all, and keep all the oil. However, Lukashenko has also been meeting with the United States. Putin sees this as making a deal with the enemy and is now untrustworthy. Russia still wants Belarus with, with or without Lukashenko. During the protest, Putin has not seen any attempt to Lukashenko to help suppress the unrest even through Putin has promised security assistance for Belarus. Lukashenko has said that he needs Russia's support more than ever. In mid-September, Putin finally met with Lukashenko and pledged to give Belarus $1.5 billion. He also, vowed, he also vowed, vowed to send security troops into Belarus if the situation continues to deteriorate. Hmm. So in the beginning of the year of 2020, they had kind of a falling out and then now they're back in good graces again. So now Lukashenko is uh, good friends with Russia. So with Putin. And so that's the end of that. Belarus. That's the story of Belarus. Interesting, didn't know that.
I like uh, I like his tactics. I he, know. He threatens them first, and then he gives them money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, because um, that was really bold of Lukashenko to threaten to keep the oil and the gas passing through B Belarus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that, you know, he, like they say, Lukashenko is the last dictator in Europe. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. But anyway, in the meantime, it's the women of Belarus that are fueling this protest. I like that little old lady. She ain't scared. Yeah, me. that little lady, she's something. <laughs> right up to his face. <laughs> she's not afraid. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Donna and Brother Renee. You're welcome. Two good presentations. Yeah, praise God. Interesting. Yeah. Praise God. Okay, I'm going to stop. Okay. Well, thank you. Great presentations, like you said. Um, let's see. So, did does anyone else have one? Um, Tony, are you back? Antoinette, nope, she's completely gone. Okay. So, um, it's only 15 minutes till 3.30. Um, does anybody have any questions for Donna or Renee? Yes, any questions? Okay. I can't think of any more, but honestly, it was so enjoyable. Thank you so much for all your efforts and and uh, the input. And I, it was really a pleasure to hear you both working together like that and giggling and supporting each other <laughs> together. It was a blessing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you know, now that we've done this, you know, I don't know about anybody else, but when you do these studies and we learn, like we learn Iceland, oh, you're, you find, you're almost like attached to them now. And so now I want to follow what goes on there. Exactly. You know, it's like, I, I'm, I'm interested. I'm in now, you know? I, yeah, I think that's the effect it's supposed to have because we're very, you know, in our own business here and we don't know what's happening out there. Now that we know, yeah. we're like, oh, everyone is having this issue. Okay. Yeah, it's just eye opening. It's very fascinating. It really is. I'm really, I'm, I'm very happy that we're doing this. It's very, very good. You and have, you, thank you, Adriana, for inspiring yes, you, Adriana. us to do this study because it is very good. Well, it, thanks, it, thanks to you all, it's come out a lot better than I thought because the stuff you've been able to find has been really amazing. Yep. And we need to know these things. We need to. And, and then, if things do come up in the countries that you have investigated, um, please bring that information back. Oh, yes, yeah. I will. Definitely. So Belarus is a lot like what's been happening with Ukraine and uh, Crimea yep. with, with Russia, huh? Yes, only the the Ukraine's only awesome. Lukashenko is he's horrible. He's like one of the worst dictators in all of Europe. Ukraine. Yeah, he sounds crazy. crazy. He's a megalomaniac. You should hear some of the things he said. I, I couldn't even say part of the things he was saying. He's just he's so <laughs> homophobic it's not even funny he's so anti-women like he just so totally thinks that women are just not even worth giving a voice wow. you know he's just the worst and before this study i didn't even know who he was but all of europe does wow yeah well, thank you so Next week, uh, I know that we have Jackie is going to present. She isn't here anymore. I can't remember what country she's presenting on. Oh, is anybody else? Um, will anybody else have a presentation ready for next week? I will. Okay, Francisco, and you're doing your third one. And that's, um, I can't remember. Egypt. Yeah, yeah Egypt. Okay. Okay, and then, so we're gonna have Francisco and Jackie, who else? This. Excuse me, did some, somebody say something? Okay, I'm gonna get, oh, just to let you guys know, those videos that I showed on these, I'm gonna put them in the WhatsApp because I don't know if I'm gonna have time to put it in here. Okay, well, I'll thank you. So you guys can watch them. I'll put it in the teacher's WhatsApp. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, good. 
Okay. So anybody else? Um, will you have your presentations ready for next week? We we need to keep this rolling if we're going to be able to keep doing this. So whoever can volunteer. Yeah. Otherwise, we have to replace it with something else. So. True. I guess I can do mine with Germany. Awesome. Thank you, Christina. <laughs> we'll put her official That's name. The thing note about the Belarus. Uh, Belarus is part of the old communist compound. So when you talk about them and Putin, it's kind of the same thing. All right. Mom, that's to your mind. See, I don't like this because those countries keep fighting for their own identity because you were in the communism, you keep lumping them in with Russia and they're fighting that same thing. It's the same mentality they're coming from. It's Romania the same. What, meant, what do you mean? What do you mean, Adriana? Is where men have, it's like everywhere in the world, but they do not accept LGBTQ. They do not accept women. Oh, that's not what I was talking that's about. I'll talk to you later about it. It's okay. okay. And so while, while um, Adriana has this open, does anyone want to uh, as a volunteer for any more countries? Do any of those sound interesting? And you could add your name to. Uh, oh, Tony. So Tony didn't get to do hers today. So I'm guessing she could probably. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. I'm going to put a maybe. We'll see. Just okay. Christine, we're working on Spain. We should have it ready in a week or two or three. Great. And is your name already on it? Yeah. Yeah, on Renee. It. Yeah, we're, yeah, I'm on it. Okay, great. Nice. Okay. Let's see. Um, anybody else want to add a name? Okay, that mayor was not in 2020. It was. Um, no, she was earlier. It was back in the 15, 16. 15? 2015 or something. Oh, okay. He said that the uh, that mayor in Romania was somewhere around 2015 or somewhere around there. It wasn't a recent one. No, it's not a recent one. You can add my name to uh, th three more if you want. What, what countries would you like? Mm -hmm. What countries? Pick me, pick me three good ones. Well, what's good? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, Pakistan looks good. Would you just say Pakistan? Yeah. OK, Pakistan. Mm. Kenya looks good. And Argentina. Awesome. Anybody else? Argentina should be interesting. Yeah. That's where Pope uh, Francis was for oh. so many years and all the dirty wars and all those people that went missing, but I don't know much about how they are with sexism and equality, but that'll be interesting. It's where a lot of the Nazis went, Argentina. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. The rat wow. trains. Mm -hmm. Wow. But I'm sure they're for equality. You can put me down for Montenegro. Sister Donna posted the uh, the prime minister. I found a female prime minister in 2018. Romania. 
Yeah, in Romania, but I didn't find a mayor, so I'm, I'm still looking. I'm going to try to do this one. Maybe we'll see if I can pull it off. <laughs> I've got to transcribe a bunch of stuff, so. Okay, we'll go with that for now and then we'll see how we do next week. Great. Thank you. No problem. And thank you to everyone who's been participating in that. It's been really educational. Yes, definitely. Okay, so it's almost 3.30. Any questions, any comments? Hey, does it? Good Sabbath. Yeah. Would anybody like to say the closing pair? I'll close. Okay. We thank you, Holy Father, for letting us assemble under your name. We pray for your blessings, Lord. We ask that you, you draw us all near, especially in this time of trouble. All the agitation still bothers us and our faith is weak and we get nervous. But we will follow you, Lord, wherever you lead. And we thank you for blessing us with this Sabbath day and all this fellowship with our church family. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in your holy, mighty name. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Francisco. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you. thank you, everybody. Beautiful day. Hey. Yes, it was.